Greetings. Uh, my name is Kenny Hillier. I uh, do academic work in North Carolina in America. Uh, it was my hope to be with you all this semester, but um, I have a number of health concerns that has made it so that I can't visit. And so we were hoping to record a couple of lectures just to encourage you and to help you as you try to understand Old Testament theology and uh, how the Old Testament does bring richness to the ways that we understand uh, what Jesus does in the New Testament and how the church operates. And so um, I hope these lectures are encouraging to you. I hope they uh, grow your faith, but also grow your ability to love the congregations that you're over and um, care for the people whom God has given you responsibility for. So uh, thank you, and let's get started uh, looking at covenants in the Old Testament. We have to begin with the question of what is a covenant? Um, it's not a common word for us in America. I would imagine it's probably not a common word for those of you in Nepal. But what does covenant mean? Typically, when we speak of covenant in relationship to Old Testament theology, we're really speaking of the backbone of theology and scripture. Um, just in a broader sense, uh, using the covenants, we can begin to understand how it is that God relates with his people. And foundationally, the word in Hebrew for covenant uh, denotes kind of a, re a relationship. So the Hebrew word is berit, and it uh, comes from an Akkadian word, uh, baru, which means to bind, to tie up, to fetter. Uh, and so at some root, the Hebrew word is, um, for covenant, is a lot like uh, a bind that ties two relationships together. And the idea is that it, it, it can't be broken. It, well, I mean, it can be broken. But if it is broken, it typically ends in the death of the one who breaks the covenant. Um, the, the word is, is uh, uh, often directed towards a pledge. Um, and this pledge is a lifetime pledge. It's, uh, it's not one that is taken lightly. It's not one that is without consequence if we break it. Um, some call it a solemn oath. Uh, often, as a pledge is made in a covenant, especially in the biblical era, certain sacrificial animals were uh, slaughtered. And as we'll see with Abraham, the parties were to walk between the pieces of the animal. And the idea would be that uh, may what has been done to this animal be done to me if I break this covenant. That's kind of the picture we get of what a covenant is. Um, it's simply or essentially a means of establishing a bond or a relationship that ends in death, either naturally, like it is for the extent of the party's lifetime, or by execution for those parties that are unfaithful. And that's, again, why you have the slaughtered animals. So if a solemn oath is essentially what a covenant is, then we have to ask the question, what, an, what this oath functions as? Or how was it used? And uh, this is helpful because uh, in, in broader terms, we, we break down covenants, um, we tend to break them down to covenants between men and covenants between men and God. And it can speak to a covenant being between men in a treaty or an alliance. Uh, we see this in Genesis 14, kind of in passing, that Abraham had made a treaty with the Amorites, and they helped him when he went to go get Lot. Um, it can stand for a constitution made between a king and his subjects. Uh, apparently David did this with the elders of Israel in 2 Samuel 
uh, it can show the interaction between relationships. So David and Jonathan's close friendship um, is actually described as a covenant, not necessarily that they made a covenant, but that their bond of friendship was covenant-like. Um, it can also be used to describe the relationship established in marriage. So Proverbs 2.17 does this, and so does Malachi 2.14. And all of these interactions that Berit uh, describes or covenant describes is happening between people give us a window into better understanding how covenant with God itself works. Um, it's almost as if giving us these earthly relationships uh, help us to better understand how to relate to God. And I think further emphasize why it is that the church operates like a family and why we need one another in order to grow personally in our relationship with God. We, uh, in some sense, cannot understand our relationship with God if we do not understand our relationship with one another. Um, so first, it's described as friendship with God. Um, when we're speaking of covenants between man and God, it's described as a friendship with God. And we, we see this in Psalm 25, 14, uh, which reads, the, the, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. So if you have come to enjoy the covenant with God that we have in Christ, if you have come to delight in serving him, it's because God has, in Christ, proclaimed you to be a friend and has made known to you the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, more often, and for the bulk of our time together, we're going to be examining how covenant is used to describe a, a divine constitution or ordinance. Um, Often, it's accompanied with signs and pledges, but before we jump into these various divine covenants in the Bible, I really think that it's important to deal with uh, two, two other issues. First, covenants in the biblical age were not a new thing. Um, now, there was a time in scholarship in around the 1800s before we made certain uh, archaeological discoveries in the 1900s. Uh, that the covenants were a brand new thing that God established and therefore they're very unique and uh, ordained as, a, as a, a completely different thing in, in comparison to the cultures around Israel. Uh, but since we found, uh, since then we found Hittite documents, uh, some documents, uh, Akkadian, that show that covenants actually were pretty common in the ancient times. Um, and this means that when God made a covenant with his people in, in Scripture, they generally understood what was happening. Um, there's a broader history of covenants that they can draw from to better understand what is expected of them from God and how it is that he's relating to them uniquely. So even though covenants are not different, they're not um, something new to the people of Israel, God does things with them that is new, and uh, I hope to be producing a lecture for you on worship, uh, which will actually really show that in vivid detail, um, even down to, uh, you know, in the temples and in their worship, it was very similar to the cultures around them, but it had a completely different purpose, and uh, definitely was... Uh, the opposite or, or, or opposed to what was going on around them. Um, one theologian has said that when God speaks to us, he speaks to us like we do babies or toddlers. Uh, and what is intended by this is that he stoops down to our level and speaks simply in a way that we can comprehend. If, if he didn't make these accommodations, I think it's reasonable to believe that we would never understand him. Uh, if we look at how the people of Israel respond when they're in the wilderness, they're not obedient. They, even though he stoops to their level and speaks to them kindly, they're not obedient. Um, and we see this as a picture in uh, Amos and Hosea when, when God says that he led uh, the nation Edom uh, like a father teaching a child how to walk. Um, and we see this with the Pharisees. We see this with the apostles in, in, in the Gospels when you know, Jesus is trying to teach them deep truths and in stooping to their level to do so, beware the leaven of the, of the Pharisees, and yet the apostles don't get it. And so I think if God didn't come down to us, we would never have understood him.
And I think this speaks to the humility of God and wisdom of God uh, that we often take for granted. So, point number one, covenants are not new. Uh, they were regularly used in daily life in the ancient Near East, and for this reason, it's important to understand how they were regularly used so that we can get a better sense of the unique nature of God's mission and how it differs from the typical thinking and actions of men. In other words, um, you know, as we look at the covenant stipulations, especially the Mosaic Covenant, and what God required of them, and the fact that Israel so blatantly has record, they are written down as disobeying, uh, we can see that, that God's doing something different. Men would record this this way. Uh, if they created the covenants, they would probably be able to keep them. We, we have a tendency to create rules that we can follow. Um, this distinction, this distinction between uh, how God relates to us and how men tend to think of these things, um, it, it exists today, especially for you as you live in a land filled with temples and idols. Uh, you see the differences between Christ's people and those who are not his in a very open way um, with the priests that walk around and bow down and, and they wear the special robes and the, and the paints so that you know who they are. Um, in America here, a lot of that idolatry is hidden. We don't see it. Uh, it exists in the way the things we purchase uh, the way we try to ensure that we ourselves can control our life in a way that shows we don't need anybody's help, much less God's. Um, and so for us, it's a little more hidden, but for you, I feel like it's, it's more open. But the second thing is that we have to draw a distinction between covenants and contracts. Um, it, it has been... It has become common, I think, in a lot of circles to think of uh, covenants just as another form of contract. Um, uh, since contracts and covenants both regulate human interaction, they do look a lot alike. Uh, you know, I, if I'm under contract, will act differently towards somebody I'm in contract with. Uh, the problem is that they're not the same and uh, the motivations tend to be different. So one scholar draws the distinction that contracts tend to be limited by the terms of an exchange of property. Uh, so this is yours and that is mine. Now we do this when we go under contract to, fill a, to f f f fulfill a job or pay someone to complete a job for us uh, or if we trade goods in order to get uh, work done or, or to trade goods to get other goods. So if we purchase a car, we purchase a house, uh, or, as I said, if we uh, pay money to have somebody do a job for us. However, um, covenants tend to involve an exchange of life. I am yours, you are mine. So it's the distinction this one scholar draws between this is yours and that is mine, and I am yours and you are mine. You can see the relational nature of a covenant a little bit more there. Um, and this means that a covenant will cover and interact with a broader range of issues than a contract would. Uh, contracts tend to be based on profit and self-interest. So when we consider contracts, our initial concern is getting the most out of the other party that we can. Uh, when I was younger, I would manage contractors for building and maintenance. And when we would look at various contracts for a job, the goal was to get as much as we could done for the lowest amount of money. And if we could find a way to take advantage of a contractor's mistake, we honestly did. And in the same way, we would count on the contractor seeking to, make, uh, seeking to take advantage of us if we made a mistake. And this is because a contract is, in essence, a selfish thing. Now, a covenant, on the other hand, tends to be based on loyalty and sacrificial love. They, they tend to focus on creating a bond between two parties in which they help and support one another. Uh, the most common treaties, as far as we know, in the ancient Near East were between um, lesser tribal rulers and greater tribal rulers or kings. Uh, 
so that one king who ruled over several tribes would initiate a relationship with a lesser king to maybe add his tribe to the kingdom. And the lesser king would give material support to the greater king's empire and lend military aid where it was needed. And in return, the greater king would protect the lesser king from attack and give him a better status that would allow him to make stronger treaties with his neighbor. So in essence, their empires would have been treated as the same entity because of their covenant. They were identified with one another and were in an irrevocable relationship. Uh, and this is why countries or tribes that rebelled under this kind of relationship were destroyed. The great kings could not suffer rebels to exist within their kingdom, nor could they let rebels benefit from a relationship that they had rebelled from. And I think here we begin to get a sense of the way that covenants between men reflect, in some sense, divine covenants. Um, so, so before I mention, uh, before I mention that divine covenants in Scripture are a useful tool for organizing the Scriptures according to the mission of God, the covenants are typically listed by the name of those who are addressed in the making of the covenant. And so this would give us the um, covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, covenant with Abraham, covenant with Moses, and the covenant with David, and we get in the prophets this idea of a new covenant, uh, which is a little different. It is not <laughs> addressed to one party. It's addressed to different prophets, so we just call it new. Um, now, these labels are not bad labels, but they're not my favorite. Um, but they get the job done, and this is what most people recognize, so we're going to follow this and uh, work through it. Um, th there are a few things that I think we want to deal with uh, while we have all the names up here. I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to in the next session when I'm just talking about Adam, but uh, if you're reading a lot of Old Testament theology books, they tend to start here with Noah. Um, and the reason for that is this covenant is the first covenant to use the Hebrew word barit. Um, the covenant with Adam is never expressly called a covenant in the Old Testament. Um, so it's distinct from the others. Now, um, I'll give you some reasons for why I think it is. And I think it's good to keep here because it informs the others. Um, now, there's another issue as well, and that is this idea of uh, covenants that are conditional and those that are unconditional. Um, what this means is, uh, so, so I don't like the language conditional and unconditional because Every, every arrangement has some condition. You can't say that none of these are unconditional uh, in the sense they have no conditions. But the idea here is there are certain covenants made throughout the history of the Old Testament that only God can break. He, he makes them, especially we'll see this in Abraham, when only God goes between the pieces of the animals. Well, if only God goes through the pieces of the animals, he's the only one that's going to be held liable for the covenant with Abraham. Um, so in that sense, there's no condition in which Abraham can break that covenant. And so that's typically what we mean when we say an unconditional covenant. And we're going to find that there were only two covenants that could really be broken by the human parties, and that would be the covenant with Adam, which was broken by the human parties, and the covenant with Moses, which technically was broken by the human parties as well, but God covers with the new covenant in Christ, 
and the new covenant cannot be broken by human parties. So we'll, we'll discuss that as we get deeper in. But this kind of gives us a big picture of this is a really good way um, to break down how to understand your Bible as a whole. And, and part of that is because when we talk about the mission of God, and we will talk about that quite a bit here. When we talk about the mission of God, we're essentially talking about how God's, God relates with man and grows that relationship to more and more people. And essentially so that at the end, all nations, tribes, and tongues will worship his name. That mission that we often talk about in the New Testament and under the New Covenant started all the way back here. Um, and so as we talk about the mission of God, we need to talk about how he relates to mankind um, because God especially reveals here with Abraham that he is concerned with all nations, that they would be glad and that a descendant of Abraham would make all nations glad. And here with Noah, even though it's Noah's family that starts this, when God puts the bow in the sky, he says, I realize that all of mankind's heart is only going to be evil always, that their desires are only going to be evil always, that that's how it's going to work. But I'm going to put a bow in the sky to show you that I'm not going to destroy this earth because of that right now. Um, and so he passes over the wickedness of man to love and care for him and to preserve him in some sense. Beyond that, we see that with this covenant of Noah that God loves all of the created order. And that influences why he might be interested in seeing all nations come to be happy in his descendant, Jesus. And even here with Adam, uh, the penalty for breaking the covenant was die. You are going to die, and it should have been immediate. But we see in Genesis 3, that instead of just striking them down like he could have, he makes an offering for them from some animal. We don't know what the animal was, and he covers them with skins. And that signifies in some ways, as a it stands as a placeholder for how Christ will cover even their sin. And the beautiful thing is, in allowing them to live, and in allowing them to multiply, as he wanted them to, to go out and to multiply and fill the earth, he's showing his love for the whole created order. And the fact that even though this covenant was broken, he will cover it so that the sin would not be credited to Adam and Eve even. Even though we must deal with the curse and the fall now, it will all be redeemed. And we get this as we follow the covenants through the Old Testament and see how it really, like I said, is the backbone for how the scriptures work together and for how we understand what Jesus himself did. We're going to talk about fulfillments as we talk about the different covenants. Give us a picture of, of, of what Jesus himself did uh, to serve his people. Um, and I really hope that this is rich for you. Um, I did not grow up knowing these things, and I find them to be so beautiful and so helpful. And, and, I, and I hope getting to understand this is really going to help you uh, love your people and help them to understand their Bible as well. So next we'll talk about the covenant with Adam. We are going to talk about the covenant with Adam. And... Um, I just want to go ahead and read for us the passage uh, when this, where this falls. You see it in Genesis 2. Um, we're actually going to start in verse 5, but it probably, the, the portion we're looking for starts in verse 15. But I want to give us a little bit of context, help us to see what's going on, because there's some really unique things that happen here. So, 
uh, verse 5, When no bush in the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not create, caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, no man to work the ground, sorry. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and, they, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pichon. <laughs> Pichon. That's funny. Pichon. Um, it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, uh, where there is gold, and the gold of the land is good, and delium and onyx stone there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone, and I'll make him a helper fit for him. And we can stop there. So, I mentioned earlier that there is no place in Scripture where this is directly called a covenant. Now, we do have in Hosea 6-7... A verse which says um, that Israel broke the covenant even as they did it, e even as Adam did, or even as like Adam, they broke the covenant there, is I believe how it wor is worded. Um, the difficulty with that is that there actually is a city, it's near Jericho, called Adam, and so. Scholars are divided as to whether it's talking about a covenant with Adam at the beginning in Genesis or whether it's talking about people who broke covenant and rebelled in the city of Adam uh, in Israel, lower Israel. Um, I'll be honest, my opinion is that it seems to me in the context that it's referring to a covenant with Adam. That's my opinion, and because it's not settled by the scholars and there's a different ways of reading it, I don't want to say, see, it's right here. This is the only way to understand this verse. But there are some other reasons that I think that there's a covenant with Adam. Um, first, um, every relationship uh, with God In the scriptures between him and his people is covenantal. Um, what we don't know is whether that's because that's how that naturally occurs, like that's just how God relates to man, or if that's something God established as a special thing. Um, but because we don't know that, it's difficult to say that it must be a covenant. But there are some other reasons as well. So the second one, uh, um, I want to call it uh, the big story. We'll say the big story or God's mission. Let's say the mission of God. So we all understand that uh, scriptures, what Genesis starts with the garden. Everything related to mankind starts in the garden. God creates us and places us into the garden. What's often missed is that when you look at the end of the book of Revelation, 
when you look at the end of the book of Ezekiel, which is describing the, the end of God's people, there are There's language, there's imagery of a garden like Eden. And so um, a lot of scholars will, will say that the overarching narrative for the mission of God is garden to garden. That we are, in some sense, what God is doing throughout his covenant relationships is drawing us back to the place where man had right relationship with God and, and lived in paradise. And you can see how that works around. And if that's the case, what lands us back here, essentially now, and, and in Christ fulfilled, is God's covenant with his people. That covenant relationship that binds his people to him is what draws us back to that final garden that we will have in the new heavens and the new earth. And if that's the case, it only makes sense that it started the same way. One of the reasons there is what we call the immutability of God. In other words, he doesn't change. He, he doesn't change his motivations for his people. He has loved his people from eternity, as we find in Ephesians 2, uh, from before the foundations of the earth. And so because that is the case, it seems to me logical that we have a garden. Now, there's another reason here, and that is that we have a relationship that comes with stipulation. In other words, God says, if you want to live, if you want to remain in the garden where you relate to me, if you want to enjoy life, don't eat the fruit from the tree of life. All you have to do is that. Now, now I will stop there uh, and say that Adam was actually charged to do something as well, to work and to keep the garden. And we're actually going to talk about that a little bit because it relates to how you care for your people. But, um, but these relationship stipulations tell me that there is something very covenantal going on there. So I would say covenant with Adam is a fail. And I'll leave it there uh, because we are, we're pressed for time. I wanted this lecture series of lectures to be about an hour and it's going to be longer. So um, the positive side of what Adam was charged with was to work and to keep the garden. Now, the interesting thing about this language is when we get to the tabernacle, the temporary temple that they built in the wilderness, the temple itself, uh, when we get to these things, that same language is used for what the priest should do. Particularly the high priest, the priest as well. Now, there are some scholars who make the mistake of taking, what I think is a mistake, of taking this and reading it back here to say that Adam was a priest. I don't think that is the case. I think if we're reading this carefully, we start with the garden, and we move to the tabernacle, and then we move to the temple, and then if eventually we move to Christ, and the temple being in us ourselves. But if this is the linear motion of the, of the scriptures, this is how the scriptures work out, then... Adam's role of working and keeping the garden is what priests must do for the temple. They must take care to, to cultivate. This idea of working is kind of farm language to cultivate, to care for. And this is the beauty of the fact that it started in the garden. Every society has farmers, and you have this picture of working the land so that it builds fruitful abundance. And so 
Adam was told to do that with the garden, but he was also told to keep it, and that means to protect it. And we see in Genesis chapter 3 that he didn't do his job. So yes, Eve took the fruit, and she ate of it, and she gave it to Adam to eat of it. And yes, she listened to the serpent. But if this was Adam's responsibility, um, then he should have protected her from the serpent. He should not have allowed the serpent to remain in the garden. But there's another issue here. When Eve speaks to the serpent, does she say, God said we can't eat of the fruit? No. She said we can't even touch the fruit. And so there's some belief that maybe Adam failed in keeping the garden as well by not explaining God's law to her. Instead, possibly making the law more strict to protect her but as soon as he changed God's word, he's not doing this keeping. Even though it may feel like it, he wasn't. And so we have the breakdown and the fall. Now, how does this relate to you? This relates to us in two different ways. One, Christ, became the second Adam. Now we see this in Romans chapter 5 where Paul compares the old Adam with the new Adam who is Christ. But it means that when we see uh, the temptation of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or when we see uh, that's I think Mark chapter 4 no, maybe. Anyway, um, and then when we see uh, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness um, by Satan. We see him doing what Adam did not do. Especially in the sense that when Jesus quotes scripture against Satan, he does it word for word. And so here we get an idea that the fall wasn't all on Eve, that Adam had responsibility for her. But we also see that Christ took responsibility for his church by running the serpent out. But at the same time, we have a picture here of this working and keeping which the priests had to do. And we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? Um, but also what Adam was charged with, and we are descendants of his, we are sons of Adam. We as pastors are charged with working and keeping God's people. And that means cultivating your people in such a way that they bear fruit, uh, caring for them in such a way that they are fruitful and joyful and bear the fruits of the Spirit. But it also means protecting them. And I know for many of you, well, for you guys who are in Nepal, that's difficult because I know there's the temptation to allow some worship of the other gods alongside worship of Jesus, uh, partially because you're raised in a society where that kind of thing is common. But that's not keeping the garden. That's not doing as Christ would have you do. And so it does mean doing very hard things with your people, explaining to them that they cannot go to the temples, that they cannot hold any other god next to ours. And so uh, I'm praying for you all that you're able to do that. Uh, I know it's not simple. But notice here, and we're going to, we're going to get into this throughout the whole thing, Jesus Christ fulfills the covenant. He's going to do that for us in every one of these. Um, and I think one thing that is abundantly clear 
is that we don't deserve it. We, we don't deserve his love. And I, I know it's unique here. I think it's probably unique there. What we see even here in the first covenant, the covenant with Adam, is that man cannot, man can do nothing for God. And we see this in, in Acts, I think, chapter 2, where it says that, you know, man does, or God does not live in temples made by human hands as if he needs anything. Um, that those who, those of us who are in the uh, Reformed tradition will tend to call this the covenant of works. And that is um, because Adam and Eve were created without being bound to sin. So all of us are born in sin. Sin is what we know. Sin is what we do. Um, that's how, that's just, it's part of who we are. That wasn't the case with Adam and Eve. And so God could command them to follow a rule or a law and expect them to do so because they had no sin nature that we bear. But the perfect man and the perfect woman, and we have to keep this in mind, uh, the, the ancients believed that Adam and Eve were the wisest people to ever be born or ever, ever created because they were directly created by God. They were not affected by the fall, which means they were probably the wisest, the smartest, and the best of humankind ever. And they could not keep this law. They could not maintain the works required for this law. And so what that means is we can't. If they could not, as the best, as, as, as perfect human beings, if they could not keep the law, if they could not keep a simple rule, uh, we who, are, torn, uh, who are, are, are twisted by sin don't stand a chance to obey any of the laws of God ever. And so what we learn here is that we need Christ to fulfill this for us. We need him to fulfill all of it for us. Without him, we have nothing. His work is everything. And what I was getting at with that is the fact that in, in Christianity, in our religion, we have a God that serves us. And that feels wrong. And it feels wrong because, one, we want to serve God so that we can earn some respect. Um, but I think often it feels wrong because we don't realize that's exactly what we need. We, we won't be saved apart from that. And so God provides for the very thing we need. Now, I said that this is a conditional covenant. It was broken by man, uh, you might ask, well, why? Why is it that their sin is credited to us? Well, they represented us. They were the first ones, and we are their children, and therefore we inherit. We inherit their sinful nature. Uh, we're going to see this in, in the covenant with Noah. You know, the flood comes, wipes away all the worst of the world, and then Noah the best of the world, the best that the world has to offer sins, and shows that sin will not be done away with in the heart of men that easily, um, which is why we need Christ to do that on our behalf. So this is the covenant with Adam. I hope it was helpful. And we will look now at the covenant with